A warm welcome to today's talk. It's Friday the 3rd of December. Now there's an important scientific paper has just come out that gives really quite strong support for our contention that it is necessary to stick the needle in when you're giving the injection, then draw back to make sure you're not in a blood vessel first. And of course, this isn't being done in most of the United States and the uh, United Kingdom. And this needs to change immediately, especially with all the booster doses coming out. Now let's look at the science that's now confirming this. And of course, we've looked at a lot of things. We talked to Peter, the senior scientist in the, the Netherlands who was confirming our thinking. This has been con multiple confirmations of this now. But let's look at what is now in the, uh, things have been in the, in the uh, popular press and everything lately on this actually. So here we go here. Now this first um, diagram, th th this first article here is actually from the, um, it's actually from the Daily Mail I think, but it's about the Oxford vaccine and the blood clot, uh, the, the blood clot problem. Now here we have the graphic, the jab is delivered into the muscle of the arm, but can sometimes enter the bloodstream. Well, Yes, it can, but but it's really quite simple that that it, uh, it, it shouldn't enter the bloodstream. It, if, if if you draw back, then you know it's not going to enter the bloodstream. So with good technique, and as I say, I, I could train people up to do this properly in about an hour, as long as they've got, got a modicum of common sense. This is really quite simple, and I've been training student nurses to do this for ages. Now, now someone actually um, was talking to one of my former students, I won't name them, of course, um, and uh, they said, well, John Campbell said that you should be aspirating the injection. And they said, well, yeah, that's what John Campbell did train me when I was his student. But it, that now the protocols have changed. And of course, that student, now, now a qualified member of staff, is completely correct. The protocols have changed, but the point is the protocols are wrong. In my view, the protocols are wrong and that the evidence is going to be given uh, now or more evidence is going to be given now, as if we haven't given a lot already. So the jab delivered into the muscle of the arm, but it can sometimes enter the bloodstream, right? If you do it wrongly, very rarely, if you don't aspirate, it can enter, enter the bloodstream. Now, if it enters the bloodstream, this is when you get problems. Um, the, in the bloodstream, it can attract a protein in the blood called platelet factor four. So obviously this plate, platelet factor four, the, prob the problem is, that now th th this research here is to do with the adenovirus vector vaccines. The, the Oxford vaccine and the, 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 the Anson Johnson and Johnson vaccine. And we assume, I think we have to assume the, the, the Russians, uh, the, the Russian vaccine as well, the Sputnik, the Sputnik vaccine, um, because they all, they all work in basically the same way. So what, what happens is that when the adenovirus gets into the blood, the blood interacts with this platelet factor, but of course the platelet factor's in the blood. So if the virus doesn't get into the blood in the first place, you won't have the problem. It's, I mean, you've just understood what I've just said, I'm sure. If it's in the muscle, you won't have the problem because the platelets aren't in the muscle. If it goes into the blood, you'll have the problem because the platelets are in the blood. I mean, I mean, it's not, not hard at all to understand this. But let, let's carry on. That's that diagram there from the Daily Mail. I'll put, I'll put the reference there. You can check these for yourself, please do. Now, how common is this? 4th of January to the 4th of August, AstraZeneca vaccine administered across the United Kingdom. Uh, 25 million first doses, 24 million second doses, give or take. So this has been done lots and lots and lots and lots. 412 cases of suspected cerebral venous sinus thrombosis. That's the blood clots that can occur in these cerebral sinus veins that drain the blood, cerebral sinus vein thrombosis. So 412 cases out of what, 50 million doses of vaccine. So it's uncommon, but, but it's a problem. Uh, most of the cases are after this first dose of the vaccine. Uh, overall incidence of cerebral venous sinus thrombosis, this is according to official government figures, 14.9 uh, per million for the first dose and 1.8 per million for the second dose. So it is uncommon, but a cerebral sinus venous thrombosis, a complication of COVID-19 infection as well. So um, what, what this is saying is, if you look at those figures there, so it's 14.9 cases uh, per million um, after the first dose of vaccine. But if you actually have the infection, then your chances of getting this rare condition are much higher. So you've actually got a higher chance of getting the infection, of, of getting the cerebral venous sinus thrombosis if you've had COVID rather than if you have the, the vaccine. But it, that, that's not, well, it is the point because, because it's bad that people are getting these, these bad reactions. But this simple um, problem, or not this simple problem, it's a big problem, but th th this very rare problem 
um, has had more devastating impact on vaccine acceptance all around the world than anything else. And I also believe the problem with the Pfizer and the Moderna vaccines are the same because if they're not aspirated, then you'll get these uh, microparticulates going into the bloodstream. And the trouble with those mo microparticulates is, is, is that with the microparticulates, the body recognises them as being viral particles and mounts the inflammatory reaction accordingly, which is, I believe, part of the reason you can get the myocarditis and all the other issues. So, but this paper is just this paper is only about what this paper is about. It's only about the um, the adenovirus vector vaccine, so we can't be, go beyond that from this data. But anyway, more likely to get um, cerebral venous sinus thrombosis after infection than after the vaccine. So you're still overall looking there safer to get the vaccine, assuming you're going to get the infection, of course. Uh, medicines healthcare regulatory, uh, medicines to healthcare products regulatory agency. As of the 11th of August, there were 73 fatalities from the 411 events. So, okay, they said 411 events there. They said 412 up there but um, they presumably didn't get data on one but this is this is why this is so devastating there's been um, 73 deaths as a result of this in the United Kingdom and I think we can assume there's been deaths from this in other countries where the data is often not collected as well and and the tremendous negative effect this has had on the vaccine program has caused probably caused well almost certainly caused way more deaths from the from the COVID in infection itself um, but car carrying on with the, this now, so that, that's the scale of the problem. It is uncommon, but it is a big issue. This is from Science Advances, so it's a peer-reviewed proper journal. I'm going to give you evidence for that in a minute. Uh, so the chimpanzee adenovirus Oxford vaccine, the CHADOX1 vaccine, interacts with this CAR receptor, CAR, and this, uh, this PF4 with implications for thrombosis, which is the blood clots, and thrombocytopenia, which is the low level of platelets which can cause the bleeding, which is, this is what this problem is all about. Now, quite amazing, uh, quite amazing imagery here. Now, the people that actually made these images of the, this is the, this is the image of the, uh, the adenovirus um, vector vaccine, quite an incredible picture. The people, this is taken straight from the scientific journal, so you can, you can get this for yourself, but the, the, pe the people that did this, um, the, the, the people that did this actually got a Nobel Prize for, uh, for, for these images, they're quite incredible. So detailed imaging, so they should know what they're doing. And then th th this is the uh, molecular picture of the, of the capsid. Don't pretend to understand it in detail, but but there, but there you go. Quite um, quite amazing, quite amazing uh, imagery. And it shows. I think it just shows the detail that these authors were able to uh, to, to go into in, in, in their research. Superb international facilities. Now, um, vaccine derived from chimpanzee adenovirus, so we, we know that it's the chimpanzee adenovirus vector vaccine. Now, as part of the largest vaccination campaign in history, this is, this is just huge, ultra-rare side effects not seen in the phase three trials. So we didn't see these effects in the phase three trials because they're so rare. And of course, the phase three trials from memory are only about 30 or 40,000 people. So they didn't, simply didn't turn up during those trials including thrombosis with thrombocytopenia syndrome. So the thrombosis is the blood clots, the thrombocytes are the platelets, the penia is the lack of. Um, adenovirus deployed as a vaccine vector using sars coronavirus to uh, bind to plasma factor 4. So this, 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 this sorry, platelet factor 4, so this platelet factor 4 is in the blood. So if the adenoviruses don't get into the blood, you shouldn't get this problem. It really is, it really is as simple as that, strangely enough. So it's when it interacts with this uh, platelet factor four, which is in the blood. It's a protein implicated in the pathogenesis of a, of a heparin-induced thrombocytopenia. So this heparin-induced thrombocytopenia is a condition that we've known about before. Well, uh, when I say we, I hadn't heard of it, despite giving patients heparin for, for, well, for 40 years I've been giving patients heparin. So very, very rare side effect, but it, it is known to occur. It is in the, it is in the literature of the haematologists. And this is a, seems to be an analogous, an analogous um, condition so we, we did know something about it we weren't starting completely from scratch um, computational simulations to demonstrate an electrostatic interaction mechanism with platelet factor four in other words they stick together like the two poles of a, of a magnet and um, this was confirmed by experiment experimentally by surface plas 
pl <laughs> plasmon resonance. Now I don't know in detail what this is, but this is the way that molecules are activated when you shine certain sites of uh, certain types of lights onto the molecules. So it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a compute, computational simulation, but it's also got some um, some empirical val validation, is what it's saying. So it's likely is this is highly likely to be correct. These data confirm that uh, PF4, uh, platelet factor 4, is capable of forming stable complexes with, clinical, with clinically relevant adenoviruses. So this can happen. This is confirmation that this can happen in the blood. And this is an important step. So platelet factor 4, what the heck is it? Platelet factor 4. The platelets are the thrombocytes that cause the blood clotting. That's where this problem uh, originates. Now, they're, they're, they're called chemokines. Now, chemokines are a type of cytokine, these hormones that communicate from one from one uh, cell to another. The chemokine is released from activated platelets during platelet aggregation when the platelets are sticking together and promotes blood coagulation in this case in the cerebral sinus veins as we've seen with these tragic consequences. Also has a role in inflammation and wound repair and again we know that the inflammatory changes are also part of the problem in this in this syndrome. So this is all hanging together. Now Professor Alan, Professor Alan Carr, and I'm going to try and uh, make sure he gets a copy of this video, at uh, Cardiff University. Um, <clears throat> so it's a big collaboration between the United States and Cardiff University. Uh, Professor, Carr, uh, Professor Alan Parker rather says this, the adenovirus has an extremely negative surface and the platelet factor 4 is an extremely positive and the two things just stick together. It's electrostatic attraction, like, just like a magnet or yeah, electrostatic attraction, the positives and the, and the positives and the negatives. What we have is the trigger, but there's a lot of steps that have to happen next. So this is only one factor. He's not saying he's worked it all out. There's more to it than this. But uh, this is a very significant step and it appears to be revealing an aspect of what's actually happening. Recent case reports show that most patients presenting with uh, thrombosis, thrombocytopenia syndrome, well, over 90% do seem to be having this mechanism. So I think it, it's pretty conclusive now that this, uh, these scientific teams have come across the mechanism by which this is working. And the, uh, the adenovirus vector vaccine complex could induce anti uh, PF4 antibodies. In other words, this is an autoimmune disease. It's triggering this autoimmune process, which is triggering this whole blood clot thrombocytopenia thrombosis syndrome and the cerebral sinus venous thrombosis, which, which complicates that. Um, in this potential mechanism, small quantities of the, vi the vaccine, the chimpanzee adenovirus Oxford vaccine, enter the blood through minor capillary injuries. Now, this is the bit that they're not quite getting. You see, these people are scientists, whereas I've actually been, um, I I I've been practicing as a, as, a, as, a, as a junior nurse and as a tutor for, for many, many years, and I've given thousands of these things. So we actually, we actually do it. And um, we, we, we know that sometimes when you put the needle and you draw back and you do get blood, they're thinking, well, they seem to be thinking that, that this is given into a muscle, but you can get some capillary damage, which of course is true. You can get some leakage from capillary damage, but if it goes into a blood vessel, you won't get just a little trickle of the vaccine going into the blood. You get a whole swoosh of the vaccine going into the blood. Just, just virtually, well, all of it could go into the blood potentially, or essentially all of it. Um, so, but, but here they are clearly saying, and this is important, blood through minor capillary injuries caused by intramuscular injection has previously been observed. They're saying this is a known thing. This proposal goes some way towards explaining why TTS is observed so rarely. Well, that's true. And the other reason it's observed so rarely is that um, in, the, in the arm, in, in the deltoid muscle, there, there are, it's uncommon to have large blood vessels in there. This happens very rarely. So it's not surprising that it's rare, but the point is it's a variable that we could so easily, so easily eliminate. Um, in South Africa, for example, we heard from Darrell yesterday and apparently it's routine to aspirate there. So, you know, they can do it in South Africa. Why can't we do it in the, our sophisticated United States and the United Kingdom? It really, it really just beggars belief that this isn't happening. Um, now, uh, this proposal goes some way to explain it because it requires a series of low frequency stochastic interactions. In other words, uh, something goes wrong there, something goes wrong there, something goes wrong there, and it all happens to, to line up. 
I guess in English would say if your stars align. It's, it's just a series of unfortunate instances that have to line up. But one of those unfortunate instances is that the vaccine gets into the blood and of course we can prevent that nearly always by aspirating, which we are not doing. First between small numbers of adenovirus vertigo, first between small numbers of adenovirus particles entering the blood. And then from there they can get into the lymph and the monocytes and the B cells to trigger to trigger more of this reaction. But if it doesn't get into the blood, it's a lot, lot less likely to happen. It can only leak into the blood through inadvertent small capillary damage, which may only occur in individuals who are predisposed to the generation of antibodies. In other words, if this, if, if this gets into the blood in someone that's predisposed, these series of, of bad events, and this is why it's so rare, but by giving the injections properly, I believe we could make it even more rarer. Now, even the BBC seems to have been able to work this out, which is quite, uh, <laughs> which is quite impressive. Um, where where are we, do I want to be here? Uh, I want to be there, that's it. So um, th th this is the graphic I've actually pinched from the BBC site. How the um, Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine may cause rare blood clots. Uh, the vaccine is made from COVID genetic material combined with a weakened version of the, of the virus, uh, of, of, a, of a common cold virus, we know that, the adenovirus. And, and, and then they say here, uh, it is injected into the muscle but sometimes leaks into the bloodstream. So the BBC have worked out that this can leak into the bloodstream. But because the BBC reporters are journalists and not clinicians, they will never have given an injection and rarely found that you draw blood back. They won't know that bit. That's the bit they don't know. Get onto the phone, BBC. Talk to me about it. I'll explain it all to you. W w why is that not happening is, is, is rather strange. I'm more than happy to do that. I'm sure there's a, there's a half a million other competent clinicians in the country who are more than happy to do that as well. Um, but call me. Call, call me, BBC. Call me. So you, you, you're aware that it can, uh, if it ejected into the, sometimes leaks into the bloodstream, and, and then the rest of the reaction can happen. It can react with the FP4 in the blood, but only when it gets into the blood. Now this paper, um, excellent paper, um, th these are the authors, you can click on it, you can get all their information. There's only a few there, there's, there's dozens more, or about a dozen more. Funding information, all completely transparent. This is, this is proper science, peer-reviewed science, Cardiff University, UK. So just to start off where we finished, even the Daily Mail's worked it out. Now, why the government can't work it out, I don't know. The jab is delivered into the muscle of the arm, but can sometimes enter the bloodstream. Well, let's make flipping sure it doesn't enter the bloodstream by doing the injections uh, properly. And uh, I think that graphic kind of explains it really. It can sometimes get into the bloodstream, but let's reduce the chances of that massively by aspirating the injection. Very, very same principles. We, we know that the, um, the, uh, the, um, the Pfizer vaccine and the Moderna vaccine, the, um, the mRNA vaccines, they, they can cause problems as well. Kyle, for example, we, we saw. An interesting Kyle with the Pfizer vaccine and Nick that we talked to with the um, adenovirus vector, the Oxford vaccine, both Kyle and Nick had a taste in their mouth within seconds of getting the vaccine, meaning to me it did go into a vein and they both got the severe, severe, life-changing um, vaccine complications. And this is a variable we need to eliminate. So there we go. The Daily Mail have worked it out. The BBC have worked it out. Um, government bodies don't seem to have managed it yet. As always, thank you for watching.